uh, hello everyone uh, after a short break we welcome you all uh, in another session of school synergy series and today we have a very special guest with us miss uh, santhya vikram she is known for her work in childhood education teachers empowerment of as well as women empowerment and uh, she is also the founder of yellow train school which has uh, been awarded one of the best alternative schools in our country over the last 5 years so before uh, i welcome i hope and request all of you to kindly uh, take a comfortable place seat uh, in order to get the more of today's session and with these words now i invite ms santhya to please come and begins today's session Thank you, Shalini. Good evening, and a warm welcome to everyone here. And it's wonderful to be amidst all of you this afternoon. As a nation, I think we are getting ready to receive our children. Some states have already opened the gates, and some other states are still in preparation. and the focus this afternoon is really about how do we as teachers prepare our hearts prepare our classrooms prepare our intimate spaces to receive the children so let me start with a small story one of my favorite storytellers susan perro um once said that this world is not made of atoms this world is made of stories and um, i thought i should bring this story which is quite metaphorical in terms of just our journey as educators in the last 20 months um it's uh, called the selfish giant by oscar wilde and i read just parts of the story every afternoon the children from the village used to come to the garden to play it was a large lovely garden with soft green grass Here and there stood some beautiful flowers and the birds sat on the trees and sang so sweetly that the children used to stop their games in order to listen to them and they always said how happy we are here and one day a selfish giant came to the garden when he saw the children playing in the garden he got very angry and he asked what are you doing here and then he told the children that they are not allowed to play in the garden and he put a big board outside the garden that said trespassers will be prosecuted he was a very selfish giant and from that day the children stopped coming to the garden to play and the children were in their own homes and in that time what was happening in this garden a selfish giant lived in this garden where there was only winter and the birds didn't care to sing the trees forgot how to blossom and even on an occasion where a rare flower would just open its petals would just close knowing that the children would be prosecuted if they entered this garden so it was north wind it was hail it was a long winter no summer or autumn or spring and then one morning the selfish giant was really sleeping when he heard some little singing and he wondered if it was the king's musicians but what did he see when he came to the window he actually saw a wonderful sight through a little hole in the wall the children had kept, crept into the garden and they were sitting on the branches of the tree and in every tree there was a little child and the trees were so glad that they were in blossom again the birds were singing it was like spring again of course oscar wilde's story has another message but i want to just bring this part of the story for all of us this afternoon i think it's quite metaphorical in terms of how the garden was and that the children couldn't come into this garden and i could only imagine corona to be a selfish giant 
and how slowly through the little walls the children are slowly creeping into the space. Now I'm going to invite you to do a small reflective exercise for a few minutes before we can really take the next step of looking at what is inward preparation in order to receive our children. So if I can ask you to, you know, take a piece of paper that you may have with you and make uh, three little panels like this, if you can fold it into three, where you have three distinct panels. Wonderful, thank you. Some of you turning your videos on. So on your first panel in the, in the middle, I'd like you to, you know, draw something and you get better what you, I mean, how you draw. That you can focus on during this long winter um, or this time of 20 months of, of being away from schools, being away from our children and being in the midst of the pandemic. Can you find yourselves? Can you find a moment that, that bring, that comes to you right now when you think of you know, this whole time of COVID and you and your journey as a teacher. And if you can just draw that, you can just draw, maybe you're sitting in front of a Zoom class, maybe you're in a, walking the empty corridors of your school, whatever moment comes to you, if you can find a representation of that. And as you're drawing this image, I'm going to invite you on the left side of this image. They can be just scribbles, they can be stick figures. On the left, on the panel, I'm going to invite you to draw a moment from March of 2020. That's just the moment before we all went into our first ever lockdown. Perhaps we all just learned of Corona. Maybe your last day at school, maybe your last week at school, maybe your last assembly. What is it that comes to your mind when you think of just the time before Corona came to us? And if you can now, on your third panel, if you can draw an image of yourself now, maybe you're already at school with the children, maybe you're waiting to see the children, maybe the school is making steps to receive the children. Just where do you find yourself now? And now may I ask you to just look at these three drawings, if you manage to draw three different images, to give really a title to each one of them. What, how would you title the first one in the middle of the panel, which is really about you in the midst of the long school closure? And the second drawing, you with the children or in whatever context, before the schools closed. And the third image of you now. Would you be able to give a title to these images? And I'm gonna invite all of you to use the chat window so we can have some dialogue, we can have some sharing. So if you can just type in, what is the title that you have given to your, to your first image, you in the middle of the pandemic? It would be lovely to read some of the titles that you've given.
if you can just put in the chat window the titles you have. It would be interesting to see it. Some of you like to share your titles. What you may have given for your drawing. I see. Thank you. Someone has said, Tevashri has said it's virtual life. On the Zoom conferences, I think I've seen that even though we can't meet each other and we are not in a physical space, we can really engage a lot with the chat window. Okay, so okay, so let me just move on to what I have to share because I'm not so sure if you're willing to share and uh, and make it like a dialogue. Um, so one of the reasons why I feel the first place to start for a teacher who's preparing to receive the children is really the teacher's own inner life. Because it's, it's my conviction that unless we are in speaking terms with who we are and what lives inside, it's not possible for us to be in speaking terms with our children and what lives inside them. Of course, we can talk about the curriculum. Like when we work with um, um, educators like Parker Palmer's ideas. You know, he says the outer can meet outer. So when we want to discuss lesson plans, curriculum, teaching learning moments in the classroom, in some way the outer can connect with the outer. And when we need to go some layers deeper and when we want to begin to connect to the inner, to what lives in the child, to what lives in another human being, then we have to, as a first step, connect with what lives inside. So it's the outer meets the outer and the inner meets the inner. And I would like to read something very beautiful from Parker Palmer. If we want to grow as teachers, we must do something alien to academic culture. We must talk to each other about our inner lives. Risky stuff in a profession that fears the personal and seeks safety in the technical, in the distant, and in the abstract. I think we as, as professionals, um, policies and curriculum and the technical, the distant, and the abstract can give us safety. But he says almost that risk, it's, it's a huge risk when we begin to talk about our inner lives. And for us, in order to be able to work with the children's inner lives, I think that's just the first place. And my, my request or activity to just draw and bring from our subconscious what lives within us um, is really like a window to sharing that as teachers, we must first begin to get in touch with that. And I can share a little experience from our school. When we all came back to school in the month of June this year, June of 2021, we usually spend the first two weeks before we invite the children with our mentors, we have retreats, and we, um, we look at our whole annual plan. And there's a certain rhythm and ritual life that welcomes us back into school, into the life of the school. But this year, in June, when we met as teachers, of course, we met on Zoom. Schools were still closed. It was a very unusual setting because as a, as a community of teachers, there were many of us in our community 
who had um, lost friends, who had lost extended family members. And May was a very hard time. It was like a death parade in Coimbatore, uh, where we live. So in June, when we came back, we recognized that we were, we were in no way ready to meet the children, even for online work. That as a community, we felt quite fragmented. We felt vulnerable. We felt not really alive for the task in front of us. So even though it was online um, connection, we did three days of working with, with grief. Um, we invited um, people who are grief workers to come and spend three days of a few hours with each one of us, not with each one of us, but with us as a circle, to really begin to speak about what lives in our hearts, what we need to find expression for, what we need to grieve about. And I could see, and then when we did that, we all felt we must do this work with our parents, with our families. So we had 500 families, that's, um, that's our entire community. We had these 500 families spending three days or few hours in the evenings on a large Zoom conference where we did a lot of grief work because this was also real for everyone in the community. And then when we had finished that in about two weeks of this kind of work, we felt like we had found the energy to make the first steps for our work this year. And I share this because I think to recognize what, what lives within us and to recognize it, to transform it, is often a very essential step for us to be able to work with the substance of the germ brain. Um, so I wanted to also share with you, I don't know the context um, from which you all come, whether you work with um, schools where there are children from underprivileged backgrounds, or you work with children with various remedial needs, or you work in private education. In fact, interestingly today, we, uh, I'm just sitting in our um, conference room, but we have outside the school, in the school, we have 200 uh, school uh, principals and teachers from um, the government schools in Tamil Nadu. And we are working with them over the last two days on trauma-informed education. Because if we look at um, the, the, you know, what uh, the United Nations have to share with us, while the children haven't been the face of the pandemic, um, the impact that it's had on children is quite uh, immense. And um, India has had one of the longest school closures. In fact, I've been actively championing in, in our state um, for opening the school. And I think our state was one of the earliest to open the school in early September. Um, and really working with uh, ideas from trauma-informed education. Because if you look at um, trauma-informed education, We've always found its potency, its place, um, either during um, displacement, like in a tsunami or earthquake or refugee camps or war-torn um, sites. But, you know, if you look at, look at the pandemic itself, and while we're talking about learning gaps and learning crises in children, I think if you look at India's most vulnerable children, the living crisis, the domestic violence, the exploitation is so much larger than the learning crisis. And I think it's not just India's most vulnerable children. I think almost all the children have been vulnerable. And in our school, we always used to say, the children who come from loving homes come here so they can learn. The children who come from homes where they don't find the love come to school so they can be loved. So for many children in modern families, schools were also some kind of a sanctuary where they could come away from. 
And in the pandemic, although the families intended to keep the children at the heart of it, maybe it was impossible for many families, given what families had to endure. And we all know that for children, it's like osmosis. They're in an environment and they breathe in the struggles, they breathe in the grief, they breathe in the crisis, the financial or emotional or whatever they may be. So if we look at children, whether they come from vulnerable spaces or not, I think the children are, bear, are going to bear the scars of the pandemic for a long time. And therefore for teachers, the first place is to become aware that they come back to us bearing some scars, something or the other. And I wish to read something from Mark Twain, a line that I really love. He says, nothing that grieves us can be called little. By the eternal laws of proportion, the child's loss of a doll and a king's loss of a crown are events of the same size. So who are we to compare those losses? And yet those losses are there, are real. So how do we meet the children and how do we heal the children? Um, when they come back bearing these losses. And um, a metaphor that as a teacher community, we all relate with very closely is, you know, if I were to ask you a question, um, what do children look forward most to when a school year opens? You know, every year in June, we open school after summer break. And if I were to ask you, what do they look forward the most? Maybe you could share it in the chat window. They would look forward to having new pencil boxes, new bags, yeah, new things, new notebooks. And, you know, in that context of thinking, I'd like to present uh, an idea that maybe this time around when the children are coming back, they're bringing invisible bags. Each one has in those invisible bags experiences of the last 20 months. Could be moments of isolation, could be experiences of loss, could be experiences of fear and grief, and multitude of other things, joy and happiness and longing, what have you. And every child is bringing this invisible bag. And for a teacher, I think it's just beautiful to begin to ask ourselves, what is it in that invisible bag? And how do I cover what, uncover what's in that invisible bag? And what do I do with the substance I find in that bag? What, how do I heal what's in that bag that needs healing? How do I attend to something that's calling out to me from that invisible bag? So I think the whole idea to become aware, sensitive, to the fact that the children are bringing some substance with them, unprocessed experiences, difficult experiences, perhaps traumatic experiences, is a wonderful place to start. And I'm going to now share some work that we've done and share some drawings, some writings of children and some, some work um, that triggers um, this kind of expression because it allows us to sort of see how we could use art, how we could use theater, how we could use poetry, how we could use, um, you know, writing and many other forms of expression to really find what lives in that invisible bag. Yeah. So this is, you know, just, uh, four months into the lockdown, we had asked the children to look around in their homes. We were all in online education at that time. Much of this work was really done at that time and some now too. We'd asked the children to look around in their homes, find things that they used when they went to school and speak to those things and ask those things, what do they miss the most about not accompanying the child to school? And I brought some samples. There are, there's a child who's written, my shoes are sad, so very sad. And we asked them to title the drawing. So this child has titled the drawing, Missing the Red Mud. 
And this is what he's written. I don't know if you can read it. It says, I'm heartbroken. Do you, do you realize that you haven't touched me for a whole month? When will you wear me and play football? I remember all the goals you used to serve with me. And this is the shoe speaking to the child. And the title is Missing the Red Mud. Red, red There's another child who's drawn his sweater, his sweatshirt, and he's written, when, when you will be ready to go to school, if it will be cold, you would come and take me to be warm. I love those times. Now I'm wrinkled everywhere and kept in a corner, folded. I'm really sad. And because of that, I don't have the will to dream the fabulous days together. How beautiful this child says, he doesn't even have the will to dream, let alone the will to do. Yeah, this is one um, question that was asked to the children. Now we made, as teachers, we made little, there, there's, a, there's a Guatemalan tradition of folklore where they make something called the Wari dolls. And we used to make these dolls when the children were at school. So as teachers, we made Wari dolls for every child. And we sent it in an envelope with a letter. So we asked the children to speak to the Wari doll about what, what ails them in their heart. And there are some responses to that. This, this little child has written, if the little Wari doll came to me and asked, what worries I have, I said I want to protect all of us from coronavirus. And then there's a slightly older child in middle school that's written my poem about my fears to the worry doll. Fear, she takes the worry doll of mine with a crystal as her chain and a firefly as her pet. She zoomed to me in the dark twilight. She was as bright as pearls with hair that had curls. And here she is, the worry doll of mine. I give her my fears that once had controlled me. Losing someone I love is an out and out disaster. The darkness that I fear, but I think I can bear. This is all I told her as she caught my fear. Now this is a, this is a long poem that a middle schooler wrote. And now this is so moving. We asked all the children in the school to draw Corona and said, if coronavirus was an animal, what would that animal be? And what is it doing with people? Why don't you talk to this animal? And many children wrote many things and I find this one particularly so moving. It's a little child and saying, why are you eating people? And Corona is saying, I'm hungry, that's why. And she says, it's enough, leave the world. Your tummy is already full. And you see what is so dis you know, just dis disconcerting in a way is, you can see the mouth of this man eater and there's already another little girl there with a blue dress. And at its foot, there are already five children. It's like Corona's waiting to eat them next. And she's saying, your tummy's already full, please go. I mean, a very childlike, innocent, and yet, yet telling us something. And this is, we ask children, draw some frames from your time. Um, at home and send it to us. <coughs> so this child who goes down to the park to play in purple and then coming back home, mother's busy and she is also looking after a small baby. Not looking after really, but oftentimes maybe looking after and she's got tears in her eyes. There you can see two images. This is another child who's writing about experience at home. She has two younger siblings. So she's put mom and dad and her together. And we said, if, your, if this, we, we made a, a little story called that your house was a tree. So in this tree house, there's a mother, father and the child, but she has thrown the siblings out of the tree house. You can see them, they're both on either sides. She doesn't want them in, in some way. Maybe she's not getting the attention. I don't know, I don't want to interpret this art, but. The, this is saying something to us when children draw. Now we told the children once, can you tell us one word to describe your life at home? 
Many of them wrote boring, lonely, hell, different, tedious, desperate, aimless, annoying, unknowingly, monotonous, low, stressful, nightmare, nightmare. seeing only four faces. <coughs> we ask our children, what's your worst nightmare? The first one, recently I've not had any dreams, but the recent nightmare was shocking. There was nobody around me. Everything was dead and gray. It was real and shocking. Once we ask the children if their three wishes, what would they be? And they write it and send it to us. Some children said to have a home again, to have a cat or two, another dog, to be happy and not worry so much as a small child, to start normal school, to feel normal. A child that says, I want to sing all the songs in the assembly. You see, that tells them the longing for the rhythms of life. There's another child that's written, first, I wish Corona was, was over. Second, I want school to open. Third, I want everyone to be happy. There's that childlike, beautiful intention for the world. There was once a teacher asked in class, if you had a question to ask God, what will you ask God? Some child wrote, did Corona come because we treated nature so badly? Will Corona die? When will I be with my friends? Why do bad people exist? One child who had lost grandpa wrote, why my grandpa? And another child just said, will you eat ice cream? You see, they're both spectrums. Why my grandpa? And will you eat ice cream? And we said, when you're 40 years old, this we ask the high school children. And if you were writing your biography and you wrote a chapter about the two years of staying home, what would you title that chapter? Some children said, from hell to heaven. The unexpected boredom, nature's revenge, school sick, era of torture, dark ages, part two, worst nightmare of my life, the half death, the void in my life, logging into life, alone, hell hole, dying, but still breathing. Yeah. So there was a lot, once we just asked a simple question, we wrote to children a letter that said, you know, in the corridors when we met you, we always said, how are you? We don't end up asking this question to you nowadays. So we just asked one single question, how are you? And the responses, some of the responses, I'm mean, excruciatingly depressed to say the least. My mood is extremely fluctuant. I can be turned on and off like a switch. One child said, no one asked me this in a long time. Someone said, I don't know. Someone said, if you ask me, how are you? I can tell you in terms of physical health, mental health, I don't know. Someone else said, I'm a bit lost, preoccupied. And then we asked one group of children, when social distancing is lifted, how will your class look like? And this child wrote, this child drew, this is exactly how her class will look like. Yeah, so I just brought these as a window to sharing what happens really when we ask children, when we inquire, when we put out our hands and want to draw some substance. And then we can get a lot. And it's, it's um, something that's, that's um, a beginning for us to accompany them on their, on their healing journey. And I'm happy to have some questions before we come to a closing. Are there questions? Are there things that I can respond to? Or I have a closing story, um, a picture book with which I can close. So if anybody has any question, please come forward. Or if you have any, uh, I, your own experience over the last two years, then definitely come and share with us too. Ma'am, here I'm teaching the uh, nursery children. Yes. So uh, when they will be uh, still in a state like uh, less than five years, children are not allowed in the school. But hopefully maybe from January, they will come again. They yes. hardly got, they just uh, came to school for a week or so. Still they were crying and trying to adjust. Yes. So these things will, I think, though they are seeing us online, but uh, meeting them physically face to face is two different cases. 
So in that case, what would you suggest the teacher how to handle when the child will behave much more differently? Yeah, yeah. Thanks Thank for you. the question, uh, Ms. Devishri. I think recently my pediatrician and I were talking for a long time and she said many of the children um, between the age of 24 months to 40 months, they have developed a lot of autistic features. They are not able to establish eye contact. They don't take social cues. And a lot of other nuances in communication, in social engagement. And many, many families have kept the children within four walls for almost an important part of their development. If you look at a child who's four years old, that child has spent the last one half of his or her life not meeting people. If you look at a three-year-old, the child is almost born into this time. So children are going to come in the early ages with a lot of, I wouldn't call it developmental delays, because I think they, the, de the delays came because we couldn't provide them the stimuli that is ideal for growing up. Play, for instance, sandpit, playing with other children, interaction. So I think the first thing is to be, to be mindful that this is the reality with which they will come. And for children younger than seven, these, these kind of platforms to help them to learn, I'm not a believer of that too much. It fills some void, but it's not real learning. I think we all know that. So when they will come back, I think the mantra for the younger years is movement, speech, singing, to talk to them, to sing to them, to narrate stories, to help them to work with their hands, to help them to play in the sandpit. We don't have to help them to play in normal circumstances. Children normally play. But children here who haven't played before in the last one and a half, two years, to facilitate play, movement, rhythm, singing, stories. And I think that when we do for half a year, children can already make big steps. And for young children, I don't think we can do specific healing work like this. We can, of course, allow them drawing, but if we can provide stimulating, sensorial, rich, playful experiences, I think that's probably what, what they need. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hi, Santhya. So, you know, there are many kids who have now become addicted to the online space also. And it's also because the <clears throat> online space provided them an opportunity to shift to other forms of entertainment like videos or cartoons when they feel that the class is not that engaging. So I'm sure that these kids are going to find it very, very difficult to shift back uh, perhaps to a physical mode, although that is much, much needed. So, but how to make that transition easier for the students is something I was uh, thinking about, if you have any suggestions for. Thanks, Ruchi. I think as a world of school, for us, we were not, um, we didn't believe so much in technology, to, in education. And of course, when the pandemic came, we had to relook at our pedagogy and we had to use what was, uh, what was essential maybe in our times. But when we came back to school, we brought our high schoolers back on the 1st of September. And now we are end of November. So we've had them for the last three months in the school. And when they came back, we met the parents first. And we proposed to the parents that we will stop all forms of online engagement, no more Google Classroom. We go back to our diaries and we teach in the class. We use our notebooks and we work with the materials we've always worked with. And parents said they are willing to support, but they felt that the children wouldn't be able to manage. But as a school, we laid down the foundations and we told them this is how always school was and this is how it would be now. Of course, there was a lot of conversation. There was a lot of dialoguing. And our children made that step. 
with a lot of conversation. They made that steps. In our school, we don't allow technology. So they come here without any technology, they learn, and it's been three months. But there, also, there were also times where we worked with other schools and other school leadership as part of my work, which can't take a stand like this. And one of the things I think I find meaningful, especially with high schoolers, with adolescents, is to be in conversation, conversation, conversation. Really, what has social media done for them? What has it done to them? Um, for instance, like right now, I'm talking to a lot of young people, 17, 18 year olds about pornography. And sometimes in the first one or two uh, circles, they're all sitting a bit, uh, bit awkward, but soon enough, they begin talking about it. We talk about what, what does it do to humanity? What does it do to feeling life? What does it do to human relationships? Or what, 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 what about all this violence and gaming? Why can't we have games that aren't killing people? And what is the subtext? What is the narrative? Uh, what is the meta narrative in these games when they're killing people? And I feel young people have to be engaged in these conversations. And that may not, one of our teachers was joking, you know, this may not stop them from um, doing uh, PUBG games or watching pornography, but it may make them think about it when they're doing it. It may make them think about the conversations we've had. So I find that conversations are very helpful to just bring and ask them, what does it do to you? What happens to you when this happens? You know, I, I found a whole lot of children in our school talking about how they would all wake up in the morning and start to look at their gadgets. What was it doing to them? And one of them even joked that they started a 5 a.m. club because what they wanted to get productive based on the book. And at 5 a.m. when they would all wake up um, as a group of 12 children, they would all start texting each other. I am awake and I'm making coffee. Until somebody said, hey, we woke up at 5 a.m. to get productive, not so that we can be on our groups. So I think the children are very honest also in some, you know, in some ways with themselves. So my response, Ruchi, is wherever ecosystems can dare to say we go back to what was, or when we don't find that the right approach, then to be in conversations. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Thanks a lot, Santhya. I just wanted to also comment that, uh, you know, we have also, uh, uh, in the Center for Excellence uh, Teacher Education, where I'm working as assistant professor, we have uh, come out with a report uh, uh, with in collaboration with UNESCO, no teacher, no class. And we have uh, written about uh, the kind of issues that teachers have faced during the pandemic. And uh, one of the important uh, thing that we discovered was there was a huge a uh, shortage of uh, teachers for arts education, sports education. Um, and also we felt that uh, teachers as well as students uh, needed a lot of support for mental health uh, issues. And uh, you know that really needs to be uh, uh, provided because as we come out of this uh, pandemic phase, uh, the you know as you said healing that healing has to be supported uh, through uh, ways which can support uh, uh, a healthy mental life I would say we need to think look at the mental aspect also and not just at the physical aspect although we have been worrying a lot about that so uh, I think it is a very important ideas that you have uh, discussed today yeah any other questions or comments from others, please? Ma'am, actually my nephew, he's in ninth standard. So I have observed with this online class, uh, he when uh, he is using this phone uh, too much. He is also an athlete. He plays boxing, but it seems uh, he's into depression. He needs to talk to someone, which he is not able to uh, say. Um, because the Zoom classes, either the both the sides, the videos are off, um, voices are muted. So basically, they do like games, as you say, playing PUBGs and all. So what I have like understood, now uh, he is back to school, but he's still in the depression. He's not able to come out and do his regular classes and he is not able to uh, manage with his studies, which he had before the lockdown. He was a good student. But now, 
every now and then even the parents keep on complaining and unfortunately the school don't have this counseling system which is very important i i feel and here also most of the schools do not provide that counseling thing so what can you suggest for such children or students yeah thank you i think mental health like ruchi just said is has become really it was earlier counter cultural in some way in our country right but now i think it's taken center stage and and rightfully so and schools i think you know i used to always say that no school can say i mean yellow train is an inclusive school and we work with children with special needs and i always felt that no school can afford to say i'm not inclusive because that's that um, sacred age you're an educator and you educate children and you cannot afford to say i i don't know how to be inclusive and i think today schools cannot say we don't know what to do with the mental health of children because schools have to find a way to understand mental health and i think in cases where the schools don't have a way families have to do something about it or any adult any adult who sees a child who's not thriving Uh, needs to take medical help needs to take because young people uh, adolescent and hormones and sports was a big thing social life was, was a big thing and now all of that has has uh, has been uh, taken away from them so i think children need uh, sometimes uh, medical guidance sometimes um, counseling and if schools are not able to provide it families must but i think as educators when we sit here I don't think any of us can afford to say we don't know what to do with it. I think we must learn. Yeah. I'll take my step as an educator to like talk to him though I'm not trained or something but I try my best uh, because as a student I have seen him he was always a good student but i think because of the lockdown i'll definitely try my best uh, to help him out thank you uh, uh yeah i want to add over here on the special in this particular topic which you have raised like uh, he was a good student and right now he is facing a lot of uh, mental problem but i think uh, as an educator we can definitely help a child here uh, and i would share a small uh, experience which i had while interacting with a government school uh, so the teacher uh, was uh, continuously observing the girls and he found that they that the child uh, really having some uh, depressing moments and because he could observe the kind of activities the child was involved in school so he did a bit of more uh, inspection like he went to his, his ho- her home and he interacted with the parents and tried to understand the context and tried to understand that what are the things which is so upsetting for the child and slowly he try to build over that he try to keep on encouraging the child in every space so this is something which he did for a very long time keep on uh, establishing conversation with the child and uh, trying to build a relationship not just where he uh, is looked as a someone who is there just to support the academic rather as a a very important person in her life and to whom she could share her own emotions as well as ideas and slowly she now very open with the teacher so i think uh, this is what santhya also made the point conversation and i think this is really very helpful to uh, uh, really help the child to come up with such a kind of point thank you ma'am yeah thanks a lot um uh, shalini uh, we can uh, i think uh, share the feedback form also and i uh, request everyone to just uh, put on their videos for at least just 2 minutes so that we can have a uh, screenshot of all the people who have attended with their faces and uh, we are uh, sharing a link for feedback form and once you finish the feedback form and submit you will uh, receive the certificate in your email whatever email you have uh, submitted in the form so request everyone again to just put on their video for a few minutes so that we can have a photo together with the speaker
We'll just wait half a minute more. I'm requesting once more, please put on your video so that we can have a photo together. So much, uh, Devashri, Selina, Umang, Iris, uh, Pampa, Prathina Prat Kumar, Piyo Sharma, Shubhita, Sanchari Rakshit, Jimpi Lahan. I'm clicking the photo now. Let's have our smiles there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all those people who were able to put on their videos. Uh, it was um, really nice for you to join these uh, School Synergy Workshop Series. I just uh, request everyone to please continue to join these workshop series in the future weeks also. We do have a lineup of uh, uh, more uh, such uh, workshops for you. Uh, Shalini? Over back mm -hmm. to you. Uh, yes, so we also have uh, even the implementation session for this particular session. And we welcome all the participants to share their experience with us. You could share your experience on how you uh, came up with the solution for the children facing any kind of mental problem or any uh, an anxiety or depression. You could also share your case studies or your observation with us. So it will be a learning for... Uh, each other from each other for each other so please be so, there with us yeah. yeah i i would request if you can you can also share how you plan to engage students when they come back to the schools how you want to ease the transition or how did you actually help the school uh, students to transition back into the face to face mode how did yeah. you engage with them uh, the emotional aspect the mental health aspect i think if you have any ideas about it you can propose the ideas you can also share uh, your ideas, anything that you have implemented, because this is a kind of session that we want to learn from each other. Uh, so a great initiation has been made by our facilitator, Santhya Vikram, but we need to carry it forward by think, taking that idea, owning it, and thinking about uh, using that idea in our different context, in different ways, depending on our context. So. I welcome you all to please attend the session next week also and to share your ideas about this topic. We'll be looking forward to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Shalini, what yes, do you, have people uh, responded to the feedback? Then we can close the session. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santa. Thank you. It was really nice to have you. Yeah. Okay. Bye then. See you next week.